Um, so a little yeah, professional very, courtesy very back and forth. So, Dr. Eastberg, welcome to the committee, and I will turn it over to you. And just a little ground rules: during our work sessions, we try to keep it uh, a bit more informal, so people can ask questions, uh, because we consider this a learning opportunity for the committee here to be able to understand uh, what's going on and what you're presenting. So, there will be a bit more informal. We'll, we'll stop for questions as people have them going through. That's fine. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm open to any and all questions at any time. Um, let me start by uh, saying that uh, I'm happy to be here and share the information that I have with the committee. I have a lot of data, probably more than you want to know, uh, and a lot of it is in graphic form. And uh, what I will do is I'll show you the factual data uh, for some of the assertions that are in uh, Senate Bill 5502. And to do that, uh, I'm relying on some uh, sayings of our astronauts, uh, which you see on the screen, in God we trust, all others send data. Uh, so I'm bringing data, and I don't ask you to believe any opinions that I may have. You'll, you'll hear very few opinions from me. What you'll see is a lot of data, and I hope that the data is clear enough so you can make up your own minds, and I, you, won't, you won't need to, to ask what my um, opinion is. Uh, whoops, let's go back one. Um, to begin with, uh, I need to uh, say who I am, primarily because there has been a lot of politics injected into science these days. And so uh, I am simply um, a geologist with uh, 50 years of expertise in, and research in global climate change all over the world. Uh, I'm a lifelong environmentalist. Uh, I am a scientist. I'm not political. I don't have any particular bias towards either party, so I have no political agenda. I'm not associ associated with or funded by any business group. I'm not a shill for big oil, big coal, big anybody. All of my research has been funded by governmental agencies. And I'm currently working uh, actively with an international group of geologists, atmospheric physicists, meteorologists, astrophysicists, oceanographers, and sea level experts, and other sciences in, in various parts of the world. Now, that's where I'm coming from. I thought I might start by um, listing some things that you probably don't know about or haven't heard about because the news media isn't telling you. And I've listed a few of them here, there are a lot more, but some things that I will touch on later uh, in the presentation. Uh, and that is the global warming ended in 1998. That may come as a surprise, but I'll show you the data for it. And it is indeed true, and that has been admitted by the chairman of the UN group that has been pushing uh, CO2 as causing climate change. Even he admits there's been no global warming in 15 years. Uh, the Antarctic ice sheet is not melting. Contrary to headlines, you'll see about every other day that the Antarctic ice sheet is melting at an accelerating rate. It not only is not melting at an accelerating rate, it's not melting at all. The main ice sheet, and I'll show you the data for this, uh, is in fact growing, not melting. So we don't need to fear that the uh, ice caps are going to suddenly melt and cause all kinds of problems for us, because they aren't. Sea level uh, has been rising globally and also locally at a rate of about seven inches per century as we are thawing out from a little ice age which occurred about 500 years ago. And the projections are anywhere from five feet to 20 foot rise of sea level, uh, as you'll see when I present the data, uh, is, is uh, beyond reality. Snowfall is not below normal. There have been headlines from time to time about in the Cascades, um, certainly, that the snowfall in the Cascades is diminishing because of global warming. That's not true. Four of the past five years have set snowfall records, both uh, globally and in the Cascades. Um, CO2 cannot possibly cause global warming. That will come as a shock to you, I'm sure. And the reason is that there's so little of it. Uh, it is a trace gas. It has increased uh, in its atmospheric content by only eight one thousandths of one percent. If you double nothing, you still get nothing. And I'll, I'll comment more about this lately, uh, later. Uh, severe storms are not more frequent uh, than um, normal. When we get a big snowstorm in the east, they say, oh, it's because of global warming. When we hear about a, a hurricane on the east coast, they say it's because of global warming. Uh, it isn't. Uh, and I will show you data that shows that actually the extreme events, severe storms, are actually declining. They're not, they're, they're not becoming more frequent. And uh, finally, you may be surprised to know that the oceans are not acid. Oops. Uh, Mr. Chair? One second, let's go. You want to go back? 
I think Senator Anker has a question. Oh. I'll have several later, most of them I'll wait until the end. Just on that last point, the oceans are not acid. Are you saying that ocean acidification does not exist, or are you saying the oceans entirely are not acid? I think all of us would agree with that. Nothing is an acid, so. The what, oceans what are not acid. Uh, 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 pH, which is a measure of acidity, uh, is um, a measure on a scale, and 7 is neutral. The oceans have a pH of 8.2, which is alkaline, not acid. And I'll show you why they are not going to become less alkaline, much less more acid, uh, with increasing uh, temperature change, if that, in fact, were to happen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to clarify my question, and I'll be a little clearer here then, uh, do you believe that ocean acidification exists in the world's oceans today and here in the Northwest? No. I'll show, I'll show you the data. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in detail. If, if, you, if you'd like to wait till I get to those slides, it'll be clearer, I think. Badly. Thank you. It's very clear, and, and I'll, show you, I'll show you the data. So. What I did was I looked at specific issues that formed the basis for Senate Bill 5802, and I listed six of them. And so what I did was I pulled out data that relate to all six of these premises that are uh, inherent and formed the basis for Senate Bill 5802. Uh, regardless of, of the language of the bill, this is what uh, the bill was based on um, as, of, as of this weekend. Um, and I'll, I'll, you can read them, but emissions of greenhouse gases is the principal cause of climate change. A lot of data, I'll show you that. Sea level is rising at an increasing rate because of global warming. That's not true. I'll show you the data. Frequency of severe storms is increasing because of global warming. That's not true. Reduced winter storm packs and decreased summer stream flow is not true. Increasing acidification of the state's marine waters. That may or may not be true in terms of the, of the state's marine waters. Certainly it's not true of the oceans globally. Uh, and finally, the production of more electricity from renewable energy while phasing out coal-powered electricity uh, generation. I'll just uh, show you some data that shows what, what this would cost and uh, without commenting on whether coal plants are, are good or not. I'm not particularly um, in favor of coal-powered generation, but there are some numbers you might be interested in. So let's take these one by one. The first one is that greenhouse gases from human activities. Dr. Easterbrook, Senator, Senator Anker has another question. Can you go question. back to the last slide? I, I didn't understand what your point number six was trying to get at. I, I heard you mention coal, that you're not necessarily in favor of coal-fired generation. What's, what's your point there? What are you going to tell my, us my about? My point is to show you, show you the relationship between coal-powered generation and other forms of electricity generation, uh, how much of it is from each of these categories, and what the cost of each is, and what, the, what changing from one to another might involve. I have no no opinion on that. I'm just going to show you some numbers. And how that relates, to, sorry, Mr. Chair, and how that, how that relates to climate. Or you're just going to show us the costs on the generation. Uh, I'm, I'm just, well, it relates to climate because the rationale for moving from one form of energy generation to another uh, is climate. It's how much CO2 you put in the atmosphere. If that's not a, a, a realistic um, assertion, then it doesn't matter. Uh, but if it is, then there is, a, there is a concern that it's related to climate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let's look at uh, greenhouse gases. Um, at, but before I do that, uh, let me say something about global warming. Um, there's nothing new about global warming. Uh, it goes on all the time. It has been going on for thousands of years at much higher rates, much more intense for longer periods of time than we've experienced in the last uh, period of global warming since CO2 began to be elevated. Uh, this graph shows temperature on the on the left hand side and the date year uh, on the bottom and what you will see is that um, there was a period of cooling from 1880 to 1915 temperatures were going down this is a, a global record and then from 1915 to 1945 the climate warmed and then it cooled to 1945 shown by this curve here global warming occurred without any increased CO2 in the atmosphere. This was before the big surge of uh, CO2 emissions after World War II in 1945. So if you want to uh, put a, a mental uh, line in 1945, that's the breaking point between increasing CO2 and, and insignificant changes in CO2 prior to that. So this warming took place prior to increased emissions that occurred after 1945 and cannot possibly be ascribed to 
CO2 as a cause. Cannot be. And then in 1945, global emissions begin to escalate very rapidly. And for 30 years, um, as the escalation continued, and we put more and more CO2 in the atmosphere every year, we had 30 years of global cooling. So the question then is, if we've had escalating CO2, which is supposed to cause global warming, why did we have global cooling during the initial period when CO2 was escalating so rapidly? It doesn't make sense. And then finally, there was a period from 1978 to 1998 when global temperatures rose again, and, and CO2 was still rising. CO2 has been rising throughout this whole, whole interval. So there's only one period when CO2 was rising at the same time the temperature was. And we can take that back uh, even farther. If we go back 500 years, this graph shows essentially uh, temperature on the uh, left-hand side and the year AD on the bottom. Each one of these red peaks is a warm period. Each one of the blue peaks is a cool period. Climate is not constant. It's changing all the time, and it changes in cycles. Uh, warm, cool, warm, cool, warm, cool with about a 30-year um, uh, time span between each one. So we could count these uh, warm periods, and we can count 20 periods of global warming and global cooling that have occurred in the past 500 years, none of which could possibly have been caused by CO2 because CO2 had not begun to rise until 1945. In other words, we have an instance here of 20 periods of global warming, similar to what we've experienced in the period from 1990, 1978 to 1998 that could not have been caused by CO2. They were caused by natural causes. That's important. 20 periods of global warming that can only be ascribed to natural causes in the last 500 years. If we go back even farther, if we go back 10,000 years, uh, this is temperature on the right hand, left hand side, sorry, it's not labeled. And uh, these are years before present on the bottom. Um, the red curve you see here, are these are temperatures that are higher than the present temperatures. And so this is 10,000 years ago at the left hand side. This is present on the right hand side. Look how much of the last 10,000 years the temperatures have been higher than they are now. Almost all of the last 10,000 years, except for the period beginning about 1,300 years ago, almost all of that, the temperatures on Earth were actually warmer than they are right now. This is, warming is nothing new. As a matter of fact, it's the norm for the last 10,000 years. The blue periods here are from the Little Ice Age, which was a period of global cooling that occurred from about 900 AD um, and may still be going on uh, for, for all we know. So what about all the claims in that temperatures are warmer now than they have ever been? These are apparently not true. And they come, those claims come from manipulation of data. Uh, here is the, the real original data. Uh, the hottest year of record, uh, number one for the number of, um, this is the number of um, temperature records that were broken. Number one is 1936. Everybody has acknowledged that 1936 was the warmest period, warmest year of this century until NOAA and NASA began to manipulate the old data and made it cooler. And then they elevated the recent temperature, made them warmer, and so they come up with a headline saying, oh, it's warmer now than it was then. This is the original data before they manipulated it. Uh, you'll see that if, if we take the, the top, uh, top 10, number two was 1934, uh, three was 1939, four was 1931, uh, five was 1930, uh, six was 1933, seven was 1938, and guess what? They're all in the 1930s. 1930s was the hottest decade of the century. Not the present, not the last decade, but the, the hottest of century. Over here, you look at all these 2,000. These are all second tier, 10, 11 through 20. This is what the present temperature has been doing, and it's nowhere close to the, to the other. And if you plot that data, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a number of temperature records that were broken in any given year. These are years down here. So here we are right here, and now we're breaking somewhere around 2,000 records, temperature records for warmth. 
And you think, wow, 2,000, that's a lot. But look at what it was doing in 1936 and 1934, 10,000. We are, we are setting record highs at a rate of about only a fourth of those that occurred in the 1930s. Dr. This is hard data. No. Uh, you can question? No, go ahead and finish the slide, then we'll have a question. Pardon me? Go ahead and finish the slide, then we'll have a question. Oh, I'm essentially finished. The, the, the point here is that the 1930s were the warmest decade, and there were 10,000 uh, temperature records set in the 19, in 19, in two years, in 1936 and 1934, and we're setting now records somewhere in the world at a rate of about a fourth of that, about 2,000. Right. Senator Ranker has a question. Um, so let me, let me rattle off a couple of peer-reviewed scientific facts that I have before me, and I would like your opinion on those. I understand that last night, uh, again, peer-reviewed data here. We Senator have, Anker, we're, we're gonna, we'll come back to that one later. Yeah, we're going to let Dr. Easterbrook no, we'll Easter finish his presentation. I'm happy to answer you your question, but I, I'll show you some here, data. Let me answer it for you. Because what you just put out in your slide goes yes. contrary to the data that I have before me. So I'm just curious if what you're basing your metadata on, where your samples are taken from, and then also what's your opinion of the data that I have before me, which seems contrary to what you're putting forward. I don't doubt that it's contrary. And what I, what I just said a moment ago was that I'm showing you the original data, and what you're looking at is the data that has been tampered with by NOAA and by NASA. And I could, I could show you curves of what that data looked like in 1936, what it looked like in 1980, what it looked like in 1990 and 2000. And the temperatures, the high temperatures in the 1930s get cooler every year. They put out a new issue. And the temperatures that are in the 2000 plus uh, get warmer because they have, they have frankly tampered with the data. That's the difference between what you're looking at and what I'm looking at. Mine is the original data. One quick follow-up, Mr. Chair. Sure. So the National Science Foundation, NASA, and NOAA have manipulated the data. Yes, that's true. I can show you the, I can show you the data that they, that they have manipulated. I'm, I'm not saying that um, they have done something uh, which is scurrilous and, and evil. What I'm saying simply is something that everybody will agree on, and that is that they have what they call adjusted the data. And if you look at how they have adjusted it, the 1930s always get lower because of the adjustments they made from the original data, and the 2,000 plus always get warmer. That's the case. And, we, and I, I can show you uh, data that will, that will indicate that if you like. Thank you. All right. Uh, here is a, a curve of, of what's called a heat wave index. Uh, these are for really hot times. And uh, again, simply to point out what I was mentioning a moment ago, the, the heat wave index for 1936 is right here. Uh, and look at the, the period of 1930-1940 relative to where we are now. This again confirms what I have just said, that the 1930s were warmer than they are right now. We had more heat records broken, we had higher temperatures, it was a hotter decade. Um, and th there's hard data for, for all of that. Uh, we hear about droughts. We had a, we had a drought uh, last year in the summer in the Midwest, which was um, not a good thing, devastating. These things happen. Uh, this is a what's called a, a drought index, and uh, the down um, trending curves here, which are colored yellow, uh, are times of, of drought when the um, rainfall is below normal and green is wet. And so, if you just look at uh, from about 19, roughly 1980 something, uh, up to about 2000, you'll see that actually there's more, there are more wet times than there are dry times. This is not an ongoing drought. And if you look also at the duration of the drought, uh, you'll find they generally last two to three years, something like that. And then they move on. So the drought this summer, last summer, uh, was bad. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it did a lot of, it cost a lot of farmers a lot of money, but it wasn't in any way unusual. Uh, again, uh, more data that looks at the relationship uh, between temperatures. Um, th this is the, the count of hot temperature records set, uh, similar to, to the data I just showed you, 1930s um, were uh, by far greater than, uh, than recently in, in the, the past couple of decades. And look at the relationship to CO2. There is no correlation whatsoever to CO2. And in fact, um, this big hot spell in the 1930s occurred before CO2 began to rise. And so it cannot have been caused by CO2. And then we've had some cooling in between and then another warm period. 
There's nothing mysterious about global warming. It happens all the time. That's not the issue. The issue is what's causing that global warming. Uh, and, and the same thing is true if you take almost any place. Uh, here are 100 degree days compared to CO2 for New York City. Again, there's no relationship between CO2 and the number of hot days in, in, in New York. So the conclusions are that 80% um, of all maximum temperature records were set prior to 1960, before accelerated human CO2 emissions began in 1945. Thus, the present conditions, the present um, warming, or the recent warming, has nothing to do with CO2. Present drought conditions in the Midwest are part of a normal weather pattern. This is weather, not climate. Um, climate is generally taken to be a period of about 15 years or so. Uh, weather is day-to-day, year-to-year, whatever. So if you're looking at an annual number, that's weather. It's not climate. And so uh, what we're looking at when you see a severe storm or a period or, or an unusually cold or, or warm winter or summer, um, what you're looking at is really is weather has, and uh, is not related to um, global clim climate. Uh, weather extremes happen all the time regardless of what the climate is doing. And the present drought conditions are not as severe as those in the 1930s, the warmest decade of the century before CO2 level. So what happened to global warming? I mentioned earlier that global warming stopped in 1998. And my guess is you probably have never heard that because the press will not print anything which is adversely uh, related in any way to uh, CO2 as a cause of a climate change. Ground measurements. These are, are mostly ground measurements. The top two here uh, are satellite measurements compared to ground measurements, which are these lower three colors right here. And you can see the shape of the curve is essentially the same. So the ground data and the satellite data essentially agree that we have indeed had global cooling uh, for the last uh, um, decade or two. Here's the trend. Trend means the rate at which it's getting warmer or cooler. So beginning about 1998, which is right here, this is the trend. Down is colder, up is warmer. Look at the downward trend uh, between 1998, and this only goes to 2004, but it's continuing on down. Uh, here is, these are winter temperatures for the U.S., and again, look at the same trend. Starting about uh, 2001, the average winter temperature is going down at about minus four degrees um, during this period. That's the, that's the trend. It's getting colder at a rate of about four degrees. Uh, another plot of that same sort of thing, again showing the green line here, cool is down, warm is up. So again, showing a cooling trend uh, since about 2001. And all the while this is going on, we hear in the headlines that global warming is accelerating and it's getting hotter and hotter. And in fact, it's getting cooler and cooler. Here are winter temperatures uh, for the past decade, from 2000, I should say from 2001 to 2010-11. Uh, in, the, in the north central states, it's eight degrees cooler per decade. Uh, the same in, in the, in the uh, north central area, um, and they range all the way from about uh, two in the Pacific Northwest, minus two to minus three uh, in the southeast. All of them, however, are colder. It's not getting warmer in the winter, it's getting colder in the winter. This is NOAA data. I'm sorry, this is NCDC, that's NASA data. Make your pardon. Hey, Dr. Eastberg, Senator Ranker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Two questions, if I may. Uh, the first one is, have you taken into account uh, uh, volcanism, uh, solar radiance, and other factors such as that in your data? Have you removed those from the picture? Or uh, which I didn't understand. Uh, the, like, volcanic events, solar radiance, and other issues like that, have you taken those into consideration when accumulating your data? Yes, but this data doesn't, this speaks only to the temperature change. It doesn't speak to the cause. And we can talk about the cause later, but the answer to your question is yes. I've considered those in great detail. I work with, I work with um, some solar physicists, some atmospheric physicists, uh, some astronomers, and we all agree on what's happening with the solar. Uh, in terms of volcanic activity, I'm a geologist, and I, I can um, judge that for myself. And I can tell you that volcanic events are very short. They're like little punctuation marks here and there. They don't persist. They're not a factor. They give you a, a one-year, two-year spike, and then they're gone. Okay, so in the follow-up, and, and this gets back to uh, the data I have before me, which seems, again, contrary, but 
Uh, so you're talking about a trend, particularly over the last decade, maybe 15 years of cooling, yet what I have before me is that 2000 to 2012 was the warmest 12-year period in instrumental record. In other words, since we've been recording heat of the planet and, the, and what we're in, the last 12 years were the hottest on record. And that's peer-reviewed data that I have before me. And so my question to you is, is, is that because what I'm looking at is has been manipulated by NASA and NOAA and the National Science Foundation, or what, what's the difference here? Because we obviously have conflicting information before us. Right. I, I don't know what, what your data is or, or where it came from, so I can't answer that specifically of why it's different. What I can tell you is that the data that I'm showing you is original data, and as I've just shown you, the 1930s were warmer, uh, were warmer decade than the, than the uh, past decade if you use original data. That's what I'm telling you. Thank you. And if you have something that's different than that, my guess would be, although without knowing what your data is, I can't say for sure, is probably that this is manipulated data by NOAA, NASA, or the sub um, subunit of, of NASA that deals with climate. And um, what they do uh, is they make what they call adjustments to their data, the net effect of which is to make the earlier warm periods, like the 1930s, cooler and raise the temperature of the last decade artificially, uh, not from the original data. Mine is original data. Is this a conspiracy? Uh, I'm not into conspiracy, so I have no comment on that. I'm simply a data purveyor, so I'm going to prevent you. I'm going to, I'm going to present you with data, and you can draw your own conclusions. You probably d didn't realize, if you watch TV news every year, that Europe is having the coldest winter in 100 years. I hadn't heard that. And I, I started looking up the data, and I, I, I'm aware that Moscow uh, is buried under six feet of snow. They're, they're having the coldest winter in 100 years. Moscow is virtually paralyzed. They had a traffic jam that was 100 miles long. Um, that's true of, of all of um, um, the, the central European area, uh, Germany, Poland, Russia, Norway, Sweden, and also Great Britain. This area is having the bitterest, snowiest, coldest winter in 100 years. So much for global warming. This is, this is uh, England, and, and England is having um, the coldest, snowiest winter in about 50 years. They're uh, not quite as, as cold as, as this part of, of the country. You'll never see this on TV, although it's big news. And now the news media in parts of Germany, Poland, and, and parts of Russia are finally beginning to say, oh, yeah, that's right, it is the coldest winter. How can we have that kind of thing going on if we're supposed to have accelerating warming? Cold costs lives. Cold, cold is more dangerous than heat. Um, you kill more people in a cold winter than you do in a hot summer. And uh, in, in England this year, um, the coldest spring in 50 years has, this is just in the spring, has cost 5,000 lives. 5,000 people died for causes that are attributable to cold. Um, and there are another 2,000 extra deaths in just the first two weeks of March, 3,000-something um, in, in February. And the only point I want to make here is that cold is a greater enemy than heat, than warm. Warmth is good, cold is going to kill more people. So the conclusion is that global warming ended in 1998, and I, by that I mean modern, which is the, the warm period that everybody agrees on occurred between 1978 and 1998. Uh, there's been no global warming in 15 years. The temperatures have not exceeded those in 1998. Uh, and the, the um, global warming that took place between 1978 and 1998 has been replaced by global cooling for the past decade despite the fact that CO2 continues to rise. Uh, U.S. winters are, are cooling at a rate of minus 2 to minus 8 degrees during the past decade, again, inconsistent with global warming. Uh, that's because global warming ended in 1998, not to say there isn't global warming. Uh, temperatures today are not at all time highs. Um, most temperature records, as we were just pointing out, were set back in the 1930s, and the, most of the last 10,000 years has been warmer than it is right now. Um, the Antarctic ice sheet is growing, it's not melting, and I'll, I'll, 
I'll come back to this in a, in a minute and, and show you the data for that. We hear every day, or I hear every day, uh, accounts that, oh, the, the uh, polar ice caps are melting at an accelerating rate, and so we're all going to drown from rising sea level. And I'll show you the data for that. Uh, and as I said, most all the 10,000 years has been warmer than, than present. So let's address the question, are the polar ice caps melting? And here are a couple of quotes I'll just let you read for yourself. Um, and uh, th this is a, a, a magazine cover, polar ice caps are melting faster than ever. Well, uh, guess what? Uh, there's no polar ice cap at the North Pole. There's an ocean. There is no ice cap at the North Pole. So we don't have to worry about it. The, the ice there is only about three meters thick, which is inconsequential in terms of the total ice of, of, the, of the continent. This is what it looks like. It's floating sea ice. There are no, glac there are no glaciers at the North Pole. Um, the Arctic sea ice fluctuates, the, the aerial extent. There have been times when it was warmer, and you could sail ships uh, across the Arctic Ocean. The Chinese did it in the 1420s. Um, and we hear a lot about the, the polar bears who are in trouble because the sea ice is, uh, is melting. Um, but what I can tell you is that the polar bear population has gone from 5,000 to 25,000 during that same period when the sea ice was supposed to be melting. And they survived 10,000 years of climate warmer than today, so they're going to be just fine. Let's look at the Antarctic ice sheet. And this is what you'll see in the headlines. It's melting at an accelerating rate. This is untrue. It's actually growing, not melting. Antarctica uh, consists of a continent with a huge ice sheet. This is the Antarctic ice sheet. It's about 15,000 feet thick at its thickest point. Uh, temperatures there are exceedingly cold. I'll show you those in a moment. There's a little arm right here called the, the West Antarctic Peninsula that has warm water around it, which has been uh, melting some of the floating ice there in recent years and causing some, of, some glacial melt. But this is a, a minuscule part of the total volume of ice that occurs on, on account of Antarctica. And the reason is that the average daily temperature in Antarctica is 58 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. The last winter temperature at South Pole reached 100, minus 106 degrees. To get any ice to melt, you would have to raise the average daily temperature from minus 58 to 32 degrees, which is the melting point of ice, plus another 10 degrees or so to get any appreciable melting to occur, you would have to warm Antarctica 100 degrees to melt the Antarctic ice cap. How likely do you think that is? I'll let you judge for yourself. It's not going to happen. The other thing uh, about Antarctica is that because of the um, situation uh, at the pole and the continental area, it makes its own weather, and there is a strong weather gyre that goes all the way around Antarctica, and the Antarctic ice cap has not disappeared in 15 million years, despite temperatures considerably warmer than we have today. Antarctic ice cap is not melting. We have ice cores through the ice cap that show us that there are no gaps in the ice record. If the Antarctic ice cap had melted before when temperatures were warmer, we would have gaps. We don't have them, which means that the Antarctic ice cap is exceptionally stable. It's much more stable than temperate glaciers. It's not going anywhere. Um, here is the record at the South Pole, which has been kept since 1957. This is the average, and you don't see any change in the, um, in the temperature at the South Pole. And there are two stations that record temperatures. One is the South Pole, and the other is Vostok, which is a Russian station. And they show the same thing, namely that there has been no warming in Antarctica uh, since records have been kept in 1957. Again, emphasize the point, the Antarctic ice cap is not melting. Um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time and move directly to um, CO2 as a possible cause of significant global warming by itself. Dr. Eastbrook, uh, Senator Billick has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, when we're talking about the melting, um, how about glaciers? Because I've seen the, the empirical evidence of glaciers melting. So do you, do you disagree with that evidence, or do you think that it's something other than uh, warming that's causing that? No, at warming, certainly, I, I agree with that totally. And what I, what I have said uh, from the beginning is that we've had um, a number of periods of warming, cooling, warming, cooling. And the answer to the question is during periods of warming, of course they melt. During times of cooling, they advance, they grow. So glaciers grow, recede, grow, recede, grow, recede. And 
uh, we can look at the record in Greenland, for example, and we'll see that the, the record there, the temperature record there, is exactly the same as the global temperature record. And so the ice in Antarctica, uh, excuse me, the ice in Greenland was surely melting um, at, uh, at, a, at a different rate from 1978 to 1998 than it was during the cool period between uh, 1945 and 1977. So I'm, what I'm saying is, yes, global warming causes glaciers to melt. That doesn't prove what's causing it. I mean, hell, I had hair before before uh, global warming. I don't I don't make a cause and effect connection there, and you can't make a cause and effect connection just because CO2 happened at the same time to go up at the same time that that the climate warmed. Because in all these earlier periods, there was no CO2 factor, and um, and it still got warmer. If I, I really, thank you. Um, so, but you said the last 12 years we haven't been warming. So are you saying that that means that glaciers have not not uh, melted in the last 12 years? No, not at all. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is that uh, we have a very good record of the glaciers advance and retreat uh, during the past century. And from, from 1880 to 1915, glaciers advanced to almost their, their maximum position, uh, certainly in the last several hundred years, they advanced. From 1915 to 1945, they retreated like crazy at a rate probably greater than, than um, the, the last decade. And then in, in 1945, the climate got cooler, and they advanced again, and they advanced to, their posi to positions that were actually down valley in many cases from their earlier ones. And then it got warm again from 1978 to 1998, and it began to retreat again. And then since 1998, uh, many of the glaciers have stopped retreating, and some are starting to advance. This is true in Alaska, it's true in Scandinavia, it's true in some parts of South America. But not every glacier behaves the same way, so not every glacier is, is, has stopped melting. Thank you. It is the nature of glaciers to melt when the climate warms. Oops, let's go back here. Here's a critical question. Is CO2 capable of causing global warming? That's what underlies all of these discussions. And that's, that's the main contention of the, uh, of the whole climate uh, change debate. Uh, what you may not be aware of is that there's almost no CO2 in the atmosphere. It's very small. It's 39 one thousandths of 1%. If we take a bucket of air out of this room and measure it, we will get 39 one thousandths of 1% CO2. It's almost nothing. If you double nothing, you've still got nothing. Since 1950s, since this big escalation of emission of CO2, the composition of the atmosphere, the, the CO2 composition, has increased by percent is water vapor. So the, the point of this is that CO2 by itself is incapable of significant global warming. That's the bottom line. I'll say it again. CO2 by itself is incapable of causing significant global warming. And so how do we get these, these, uh, these projections in? And we get it because um, the climate modelers who, uh, who depend on computer models rather than real data uh, for their conclusions um, have decided that if CO2 goes up, water vapor will also increase. And as water vapor increases, we kick in this 95% of the greenhouse effect. So virtually all of the temperature increase during the warm period that we had in, in, in 77 to, um, to 98, virtually all of that they would account for by water vapor in their models, not CO2, water vapor. So the question is, is water vapor increasing? Well, here's water vapor. Here's water vapor going back to 1947. Water vapor, if water vapor is increasing as CO2 goes up, and that's what's causing, that's what's levering the global warming, then uh, you might have an argument for, the, for their models. But water vapor is actually decreased, has actually decreased since 1947. Look at the downward trend. Down is less water vapor in the atmosphere. And these are various levels of the atmosphere. So in order for their models to be correct, they must show that there has been an increase in water vapor in the atmosphere, and it's just the opposite. There is less water vapor in the atmosphere now as CO2 has gone up, not more, and so their models are totally invalid. Their models will not work without an increase in water vapor. 
there's another effect of CO2, uh, which is called a saturation effect. Um, if you take a, a dry sponge and dip it in a bucket of water, it'll soak up water. If you take a wet sponge and put it in a bucket of water, it doesn't soak up very much more water, does it? Because it's already saturated. And CO2 operates the same way. There's a saturation level where in the, the CO2, which is in the atmosphere right now, is mostly saturated uh, with respect to capturing of, of the frequencies of, of heat. And so on this curve right here, uh, this is the degree in uh, possible temperature change with increasing in atmospheric uh, carbon dioxide. This 1950 level is right here, 2008 level is right here. The maximum amount of temperature change you could get from the increase in CO2 from 1950 when the the whole thing started to escalate for emissions, and now is less than one tenth of a degree. This is basic physics. What about just making a, a correlation between CO2 and temperature? Uh, on this curve, uh, this is atmospheric temperature. Uh, excuse me, atmospheric CO2 on this uh, side, and surface temperature uh, on this side. So here's the CO2 curve, um, which has been increasing, been going up steadily, no doubt about it. From 1915 to 1945, we had global warming with no increase appreciably in CO2. So CO2 didn't cause that warming. In this century, hotter than it is now. And then when CO2 was escalating in 1945 on, we actually had global cooling. The curve is actually going the opposite direction of the CO2 curve. If CO2 causes global warming, why do we have 30 years of global cooling when it began to escalate? Doesn't make any sense. It's only in this last uh, period from 1978 to 1998 when the two have coincided by coincidence. Um, we can also show that um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere always follows an increase in temperature, not the other way around. The idea would be that if CO2 is causing global warming, CO2 would go up and then the temperature would go up. Okay. But here's what actually happens, and these are, these are measurements that have been made by a group uh, of researchers in Norway. Um, the blue curve down here is temperature. Temperature's been going up and down, uh, as it does every few years, largely because of, of ocean changes. And this is the CO2 content of the atmosphere. In every case, minuscule, the total change is so small uh, that there is absolutely no way it can cause global warming by itself, it's totally dependent on water vapor. Uh, and there's no correlation between global temperatures and CO2. When CO2 goes up, temperature does whatever it wants to do. Um, the comparison of computer model predictions of global warming, um, when you compare those to actual measurements to see if the models were right, they are totally inaccurate. The models are totally inaccurate. And I'll show you uh, an instance of that in, in just a minute. The bottom line is CO2 is not capable of causing significant global warming by itself. That's clear from the physics. Um, CO2 is the result of global warming, not the cause of global warming. As you increase the temperature, you increase the CO2 in the atmosphere because there's more that's given up by the oceans. Dr. Eastbrook, you, yeah. you used the term um, greenhouse effect. Oh, I'm sorry, a, a greenhouse effect um, is caused by certain gases uh, that will absorb certain frequencies uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, namely, namely heat. And so the idea would be that as um, heat is coming from the surface of the earth upward, being radiated back into space, that uh, certain gases will tend to capture it, if you like, and make the air warmer. And that's why we have such a pleasant climate. It's because we have a lot of water vapor that keeps us nice and nice and warm. Otherwise, we'd be cold because all of the heat would radiate out in space. So think of uh, gases that capture heat is the easiest way to think of it. And I guess I, I raised the point because the greenhouse effect is not a negative thing. It's not what? It's not a negative thing, the greenhouse effect. The, the greenhouse allows effect. allows us to live here. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the greenhouse effect, the tendency of the greenhouse effect is for various molecules, mostly water vapor, uh, to make the atmosphere warmer uh, by capturing of heat. Okay. Um, how about uh, uh, sea level? Let's take a quick look at sea level. Um, this is one of my favorite um, uh, pictures. This is New York City with the predicted sea level rise by 2100 by uh, certain people in the, in the UN and uh, other people who shall remain nameless, 
but who are big advocates of CO2. Um, actually, I kind of like it. Uh, I'm not a big fan of New York, and so I, it would be kind of fun to see New York as an island. Uh, here, but there, there are serious ramifications if this were true. Uh, here's, here's Florida, for example, and this is the present coast of Florida. Here's what the coast of Florida would look like if sea level were to rise to the predicted level by the UN agencies. And here's what the old coastline, this is what the coastline looks like now. This is what it would look like if sea level uh, rose um, somewhere between five and, and, and 20 feet. The poster child of rising sea level is the Maldive Islands, and you're, go you're going to see a, a, a big uh, program on TV about uh, how the poor people in, in the Maldives are going to be drowning and they're going to have to move the entire nation. Um, a a world-renowned sea level expert decided to go see for himself what was really there. And what he found was this, um, that uh, in this picture, for example, uh, this is a 1979 shoreline right here. This is where the sea level was in 1979. Here's where it is now. Here's another place. This is where the sea level was in 1979. Here's where it is now. The irony is that the Maldives are emerging from the oceans, not sinking. They're not being drowned. They're coming up out of the ocean. Here's proof positive. We, this is documented uh, with the dates of when the shoreline was here with photographs and measurements. And sea level is actually lower since 1979. It's not sinking. Um, so how much is sea level changing? We've been thawing out from the Little Ice Age, which was about 500 years ago. And temperatures have been rising during that period at a rate of about 8 tenths of a degree a century, no doubt about it. And as, as that's happened, uh, sea level has been rising, uh, partly as a result of expansion of the volume of the oceans with the, with the warmer temperatures. And the rate of rise, this is, this is the rate of sea level rise, this is the year. Uh, they've been rising uh, at a rate in the early days, about 1.5 millimeters a year. That's about the thickness of your fingernail per year. You, won't, you wouldn't be aware of it. Um, so the total uh, sea level rise in the past century is about six inches, not that much. In our lifetimes, we wouldn't, it wouldn't rise enough, we'd even be aware of it. Uh, here is the official sea level uh, record from the University of Colorado, going back to about 1993. And sea level was rising, been rising at about the same rate, one to three millimeters a year. It actually went down for a while, uh, from about 206 to 208, and then now it's going up and down a bit, something like that. So no level, no doubt, sea level is going up. The question is, how fast is it going up? Seattle has a really good sea level record, tidal gauge record. Uh, this is relative sea level, so we start here in about in the 19, in about 1900, and we have records then that go all the way, uh, in this case, they end about 2003 or 2004, and they could be extended. Um, but here's the rate of rise, it's about seven inches per century. Other areas nearby, uh, Victoria, Vancouver, show the same kind of rise, about six or seven inches a century. But in some places, it's, it's going the other way. For example, near Bay, sea level is going down at a rate such that by 2100, it would be down, it would be lower by seven inches, not higher. Um, here's Astoria, 1.7 inches lower at the rate it's, it's going, the present, present trend. So there are, there are some differences up and down the coastline of the West Coast, which is brought about by local conditions primarily. The global sea level is rising at about eight inches a century. That's, it's, that's clear. So what about the state of Washington? What about our, uh, our sea level, potential sea level rise? Here's the curve of sea level from 1993. This is measured up to where we are right now. And if you project that into the future, you get a sea level rise by 2100 of about seven inches. Not going to be a problem. Here is what the uh, UN agency is predicting. This is their lower estimate. This is their higher estimate. And they're predicting somewhere uh, by 2100, 5 to 20 feet. Look how this curve, the UN curve, varies from reality. Not very realistic, I think. And there's no reason to think that there's going to be any change in this rise. It's been very constant for the past century as, as we've been warming up. In order to get the sea level rise like this, you'd have to melt the Antarctic ice cap. And we've already seen that's not going to happen. It's not happening now. It hasn't happened in 15 million years, and it isn't going to happen in the future. They're very simple. So sea level has risen only seven inches um, as we're thawing out. Rate of sea level is pretty constant, not accelerating. Um, 
some places sea level is actually going down. It's going down to Alaska. Uh, that is, these areas are emerging. Uh, Maldives, Nia Bay, Astoria, uh, they're getting lower, not, not submerging. Um, the IPCC, this is a UN agency, predicted large sea level rise is unrealistic because global warming has stopped, for one thing, and the Antarctic ice sheet is, is, is not melting. Um, the projections are for sea level rise in the Pacific Northwest uh, about six inches by the end of the century. How about frequency of severe storms? Uh, you see this in the headlines every day. Big storm must be global warming. And Dr. so, Ishra, could, I, could I ask you a question really quick? I know sure. we're getting behind schedule here, so my apology. But on, on the slide where you talk about we're going into a global cooling period, what would lead to the sea level rises during a period of, of, of cooling if that chart's correct for the last 12 years? The, the, the sea level rise is caused by a number of different things. And one is that as the temperature has gone up over the century, we've, we've, we've gotten actually warmer than the beginning of the century by about eight tenths of a degree. Everybody agrees on that. And that has caused us the, the volume of the ocean and water to expand. And that accounts, people think, for a large percentage of the rise in sea level, of like seven inches in a century, something like that. The other is melting of glaciers. Glacier, glaciers certainly did melt from, night, from um, uh, 1915 to 1945, and that added some water. And they also rose um, from 1978 to 1998. But if you look at the sea level curve, it's constant. It's not going up and down with the glaciers. So it's clear that glacial meltwater is not what's driving this constant rise of sea level. It's probably expansion, thermal, thermal expansion is what most people think. Senator Ranker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you for your testimony so far. I, I, I have a, a different question I want to ask, but I want to get to the glacier piece. I, I was just in Alaska looking at a glacier that I hadn't looked at in 15 years since I was mm -hmm. much younger, and it's dramatically smaller than it was. How do you account for that? But, but because it was warming from 1978 to 1998, and that's when most of the recession took place, glaciers in Alaska now, have, in many places, have stopped retreating and are beginning to advance. So this one in the last 10 years has decreased in size. It, it, takes, it takes a while for a glacier to feel the effect of, of warming or cooling because there's a lag effect. The ice doesn't respond next year if we have a climate or a weather change this year. It, it, the response time of a glacier to a climate change is anywhere from two or three years to, to maybe 15 or 20 years. So uh, it takes a while uh, when the glacier uh, is undergoing a climate change for it to put the brakes on and change direction, either going forward or retreating. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, you have mentioned a few times now the IPCC reports. So how do you account for the IPCC report that came out in 2007, which is due to be updated, and I, over 800 scientists are working on it now, but thousands of scientists worked on this and came to the conclusion that climate change is real and it's human caused. Um, how do you account for all of those folks saying that, and, and it's obviously very different than what you're presenting to us today? Could I answer that in just a moment with a slide? Of course. I, I, can show you the, yeah. I can show you the data, and you will be surprised at the answer, I think. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, the, the point I want to make here is that uh, the frequency of severe storms is not increasing because of global warming. Uh, here are U.S. hurricanes. Uh, actually, you see kind of a downward trend here in recent years. There are fewer, years, fewer hurricanes uh, in the last uh, a couple of decades than there were earlier in the century. Uh, here is uh, uh, global hurricane frequency. There's also a slight downward trend. The number of hurricanes is not increasing. Um, here are strong to violent tornadoes. Again, here's where we are now. We had, we had a, a bad year in, in 2011, but not as bad as, as back, back in here. And generally, uh, they are down rather, they're higher here than they are here. The number of tornadoes is not increasing as a result of, of global warming. Precipitation stream flow shows much the same thing. Um, here is precipitation in, in the U.S. If you look at the green area, that's increased precipitation. Brown is less. And from about 1970-something on, look at the prominence of green over brown. More precipitation in that time, not less. The same thing is true worldwide. Um, and the worldwide precipitation pretty much follows a climatic trend with, with the warming and cooling trends. Um, so here we, here we have a period when there was more precipitation, here less, here more. It's a cyclic kind of thing. Overall, precipitation and stream, or stream flow, I should say, which is this graph right here, this is the average stream flow index from about, uh, about the last decade, roughly, 
and there's no significant trend. It's not trending down is the, is the only point here. So the, the conclusions here, a number of U.S. hurricanes has decreased since 1851. The global hurricane frequency has declined since 1978. The number of tornadoes has decreased since 1970. Global precipitation has increased since 1950. Stream flow in the U.S. hasn't changed appreciably in 15 years, and there is no basis for predicting increasing extreme weather because of global warming. A, it's not warming. B, it's not happening. Um, specific issues, again, reduced snowpacks are a concern for the Cascades. Um, and there have been predictions since 1990 by the IPCC that uh, we will see the end of snow. Uh, there, are, there were predictions that the next generation won't know what snow is because of global warming. Um, and the um, East Anglia group of, of um, climatologists um, issued a forecast that the snowfall in, New in England this winter, people were predicting that um, the ski areas are going to have to go into another business because they weren't going to have any snow. The truth is, snowfall is increasing, not declining. Um, heavy snowfall, these are headlines, and a century hits Moscow. Uh, Anchorage set an all-time record. Uh, China is cold. Uh, and snow uh, just wreaked, wreaked havoc uh, with their transportation, um, worse than six decades. Um, here is the snowpack, snow cover in, in the U.S. Um, uh, at this date. And as you can see, there's snow clear down to the Gulf almost. Snow is not getting caught. And here is, here is the um, northern hemisphere snow extent. Five of the six snowiest winters for the northern hemisphere have occurred since 2002. Here's the, here's the um, northern hemisphere snow extent. It's not, snow is not disappearing, it's increasing. We're getting more snow, not less snow. Uh, here's a snowpack in the Cascades. Um, this is the snow water equivalent. In other words, uh, up is more snow, down is less snow. And each of these is a data point for a particular year. If you connect the dots, you get this uh, dark blue curve here. If you um, do a, a least squares curve through this to look at the trend, what you'll see is that um, if, we, if we start here about um, 1995 or so, look at the area that's in this kind of turquoise color versus the area that's in gray. More snow, not less snow in the Cascades. And then in, since about 2006, um, we've had generally uh, higher snowfalls in the present, up to about 120 to 150 percent higher than normal. Snow is not disappearing. There's no problem uh, with water supply by melting snow. In terms of precipitation, uh, here's a map of precipitation of the U.S. Green is an increase in precipitation. Green here is, is uh, up is, is uh, increase in precipitation, down is decrease. And if you go back to about 1980 or so, it's, it's mostly green, meaning there is not less precipitation, there's more precipitation. So the conclusion is, uh, despite predictions that snow will be a thing of the past, we're getting more of it. It's getting snowier and colder. Uh, and we, we've just looked at snowpacks and uh, temperatures uh, for this winter as well as for the, for the decade. Oops. Um, here's the acidification uh, thing that you asked about earlier. Um, acidification, by definition, is the process of becoming acid or being converted into an acid. Ocean acidification means turning the ocean into an acid. That's what acidification means. But the oceans are not acid. They are strongly alkaline. Their pH is about 7 point, or excuse me, about 8.2. Neutral would be 7. So what's the possibility for uh, changing that? The allegation is that because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, that's going to put more CO2 in the oceans. And at the same time, they're saying that CO2 is causing it to become warmer. Um, at the present time, we've already looked at these numbers, the uh, amount of CO2 in the atmosphere is, the change is so small, eight one thousandths of one percent changed in the atmosphere, and the volume of the oceans is about 300 million cubic miles, and we're going to change that from a strongly alkaline solution to an acid with this eight one thousandths of one percent change in CO2. Not possible. There are enough CO2 atoms in the atmosphere to do that. And in fact, uh, just the opposite is, is happening. As we, you saw earlier, 
the effect of global warming is to make the oceans more alkaline, not more acidic, because warming drives CO2 out of the oceans. Even though there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, because the temperature is warmer, the ocean is giving up CO2, not taking it in. It's a CO2 that makes carbonic acid that makes it less alkaline or, or, or tending towards toward more acidic. So with less CO2 in the oceans, it's not as acidic. It's as simple as that. The chemistry, chemistry 101, does not add up to the, to the claim that the oceans are becoming acid. I have a quick question for you on that slide also, um, and Senator Ranker does as well, I believe. So, so you would even say that they aren't even becoming less alkaline? I guess, I guess the, the, um, we don't really know because what I, what I can tell you uh, is that um, this is the equation for uh, the pH of ocean water. And, um, you know, don't try to understand this, I'll, I'll explain it. If you add CO2 to water, uh, you get carbonic acid, and that releases hydrogen, which is what changes the acidity. So that's the basic format. Um, Seawater can hold more CO2 than, than cold water than, than warm water can. So as warming occur, occurs, what's going to happen is it, it's going to drive the equation in the wrong direction. It's going to drive CO2 out of the oceans, not take more CO2 into it. And the amount of CO2 that's added to the atmosphere in terms of volume is so minute, there aren't enough carbon dioxide atoms to convert 300 million cubic miles of seawater into an acid. It's as simple as that. One other um, follow-up, our, our local shellfish growers have been talking to us quite extensively about um, the inability to raise some of their um, uh, shellfish in the Puget Sound waters. And as they measure, I guess they're seeing a, a move towards becoming less alkaline, a move towards a, a more acidic. So what, what, if it's not the ocean and, and CO2 causing, what, what could be the causes for that that they're seeing? Um, that, that could well be true because... Uh, what we know is that the, the ocean is, is not going to become acidic. We know that for sure. It may become slightly less alkaline, but there's, there's no reason for that to, um, to, to occur. Locally, because of the pollution that we're putting into Puget Sound, that may be making Puget Sound more acidic, which has nothing to do with the global seawater. It's a local regional effect by, by um, the stuff we put into the, the Puget Sound. So they may well be correct that the, the water where the oysters are living might be more acidic. But yeah, I can tell you it's not because of global warming or CO2. It's because of some local or regional uh, pollution of the area. And just really, I guess acidification, I guess, is kind of a term of art. I'm not sure if it's a, how, how it's utilized. But even in that situation, we're not becoming acid. We're becoming less. Less alkaline. Less alkaline. You're never and going so to get you, to acid, never. You're trending this direction, but you're not going to cross over that point to where you're, you're okay. That's right. Thank you. I think that helps explain that, that, that term to a lot of people also about um, ocean acidification, what it means in terms of locally here also. Senator Anker. You actually asked, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, 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 my former question, you've raised another one, however, which is, so would you say, uh, so let, me, let me ask clearly. So it, the oceans are not becoming more acidic. I didn't say that. I said that you're not going to make the oceans acid, and the total but, range of variability of a pH in the ocean varies from about 8.2 to 7.9 in a transect area in the ocean, which is greater than most of the uh, changes in any given site. At any scale, are the oceans becoming more acidic? No. Okay. And then because acidic means it's an acid. To make it more acidic means it making more acid than it was, which by definition is, is a non sequitur. Okay. Okay, and then my second uh, question that came out of the chair's question then is, um, so locally where we are seeing ocean acidification, whether that's the right term or not, according to your information, I'm not sure. But less alkaline would make me less happier. Less alkaline. Okay, so less alkaline. Um, so we're not just seeing that in Washington State. I'm working with colleagues in Maine, uh, Maryland, uh, California, Oregon, Alaska particularly. Uh, Alaska, who has... Uh, significantly less population than us and most of the watersheds are not running out of agricultural lands or other areas where pollutants they're running out of relatively pristine areas so is the impact there also uh, from some sort of pollution I, I think it, it, it probably not would, would be my guess I don't know that because I don't know the numbers you're looking at I'd have to look at the numbers to, to tell you uh, if there's a difference between some regional effect like 
pollution in Puget Sound, or whether there is a water temperature. The principal governing factor is water temperature. And in places where you have um, upwelling, where there is um, uh, cold water coming up to the surface, cold water can hold uh, more CO2 than, than warm water. And so that, may act, that might actually be causing it to become a, a bit less alkaline than before. And, and in that case, it, it's a, region, a, a, a regional thing, not pollution. Thank you. OK. Um, so we've talked about this. Uh, oceans are alkaline, not acidic. Um, the, the governing factor here is the temperature of the ocean water. Let me answer your question now about all these people who are the so-called consensus. Uh, and uh, you will see, I see every day, quoted, 97% of all scientists believe that man-made CO2 causes global warming. That's a fraudulent statement. And the statement uh, that uh, there is a dominant consensus among scientists that CO2 is causing global warming is not based on any known fact. And let me tell you where this number comes from, and let me tell you where that off-quoted um, uh, statement comes from. There was a graduate student um, who, um, it, this was in Indiana or Illinois, sent out 10,257 questionnaires to climate scientists. He, he got 3,146 back responses. Of those, he selected um, either 77 or 79, I'm not quite sure the numbers, it doesn't matter, um, that he handpicked out of this 3,000, these 3,000 responses. And he asked those people, do you think CO2 is causing climate change? And funny thing, all but two said yes, because they were hand selected. And so the real number is that there were 77 or 75 scientists out of 3,100 not out of 77 or, or 79. So if you divide this number over that number, you get 2%. So the consensus that you're hearing is 2%, not 98%. If you were to uh, then look at, well, what is the consensus? Um, whoops, let's go back to this. Uh, I have some information that uh, you would find interesting. It's called the um, Petition Project. and this was uh, a petition, and let me read what the, what, the, um, what the statement says. It says, there is no convincing scientific evidence that human release of carbon dioxide, methane, or other greenhouse gases is causing or will in the foreseeable future cause catastrophic heating of the Earth's atmosphere and disruption of the Earth's climate. How many scientists who have degrees in one of the sciences signed that? And the answer is 31,487 as opposed to the 77 in this survey that's so often quoted. So I would say the consensus is that scientists do not believe that CO2 is causing global warming, not the other way around. So if you compare what you're seeing on the screen with what I've just read you, uh, of these 31,000 scientists who signed this statement, all have degrees in one of the sciences, and 9,029 have PhDs in those. And the, the um, expertise of these is atmospheric, environmental, earth sciences, computer and mathematical sciences, physics and aerospace sciences, chemistry, biology, agriculture. These are real scientists, and there are 31,000 of them. In order for the statement to be true that either the consensus is that CO2 is causing it, you would need to have 32,000 people signed, and there are about 4,000 people who were involved in the IPCC project, and by admission of the chairman of the IPCC for the UN, 80% of those are non-scientists. If you look at the 27 people who wrote the executive summary for the 2007 report, which is so often quoted, guess how many have experience in meteorology? None. So there is the answer to your question. Uh, Senator Billick has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. So my understanding of the consensus was not based on a survey. It was based on a review of the scientific papers, the peer-reviewed scientific papers that showed that the overwhelming majority of scientific papers peer-reviewed showed either that um, uh, 
had a consensus about uh, climate change being uh, human caused, and, and, and a few that came to no conclusion. Mm -hmm. True. And that is that uh, the um, editorial boards of virtually every scientific journal, um, probably in the world, but certainly in the United States, the Geological Society of America, the American Geophysical Union, uh, Science, Nature, all of these places, will not even read a paper that has anything negative to say about CO2. So it's not surprising that there are no papers published that are critical of CO2 as a cause, because their editorial boards will not permit it. And that is a fact, and there are some numbers that go with that. I don't happen to have them handy, uh, but it's clear that the peer review process, the editorial process, has been taken over by uh, what I call CO2 dogmatists who will not permit publication of anything that's in any way critical of CO2, and that's a fact. So your statement could be true. There might be more peer reviewed papers being published right now because they won't publish anything else. Okay, uh, let's, let's finish this up quickly. Um, so how do we go about predicting climate? Then? How are we going to figure out what the state of Washington needs to do in, in the future? There are two ways to do it. One is the UN way, the IPCC way, which is with computer models. Um, and computer models, like any other computer thing, is garbage in, garbage out. Whatever you program the computer will be, it's what comes out the other end. They do not consider real life um, uh, changes uh, in the atmosphere, in the, in the oceans. They do not consider real physical data. It's all theoretical. The other way is to use real physical evidence to establish cyclical patterns. This is on the ground research, uh, the kind of uh, information I've been showing you. Um, so let's compare the two. Which one gives us the best answer? Which one should we rely on to go about predicting what's going to happen in the state of Washington? This is a this black curve here is a curve that I took as is from the official IPCC website in the year 2000. This is what their projection was in the year 2000. Uh, it actually continues on down here, ways but I don't have it on this curve. Um, and they were predicting that the temperature between 2000 and 2010 was going to be increased by one full degree, a one degree warming which is greater than the warming for the entire century. That's what they were predicting in a decade. Here is the actual record, which is the satellite record that we've already seen. And look at the gap between the two. The models failed miserably. They weren't even close. Therefore, what trust can you put in models if they cannot even predict 10 years down the line within one degree? They're useless. Um, so what we can do then is look at real physical evidence to predict where we're heading. What kind of evidence uh, can we use? Um, we can use the, uh, the natural, uh, observable uh, evidence, uh, which looks something like this. The Pacific Ocean has two modes, a warm mode and a cold mode. Um, this is what the temperature uh, looked like between 1945 and 1977 in the eastern Pacific. North America, we're about right here. Blue is cold. Uh, orange and red are warm. The whole coast of um, the U.S., clear up in the Gulf of Alaska, at this time was cool, and we had global cooling down here. This is blue down here is cool, red is is warm. In 1977, in one year, there was a flip, and the Pacific Ocean changed from, uh, in this case, cold to warm. Red is warm, and look what happened we had global warming. Surprise, surprise. The message here is that the temperature in the eastern Pacific governs the climate of North America. It's that simple. And so what we see is a regular pattern of a warming ocean water, cooling ocean water, warming ocean water, which is exactly mimicked in the global climate temperature, exactly. And uh, in this case, it's like a toggle switch on off. This change from, from cool to warm mode occurred in one year off the coast of North America, and the climate changed that quickly. CO2 doesn't change that quickly. This is not a climate change that could have been brought about by CO2. And here's verification of that. Uh, this is what the uh, temperature looked like off the coast of North America in 1977. And also in 1998 is, is very similar. In 1999, look what happened. All this nice warm water off the coast here, the red and the, and the yellow, has now changed to cold with blue colors here. 
In 1999, which is one year after the second highest temperature uh, of the century behind 1936, I went out on a limb and I predicted that because of the change in the pattern of the ocean water temperatures that we're in for about 30 years of global cooling. And people thought I was crazy. After the hottest year in a long time, how could I predict we're headed for global cooling? The truth is, it happened. I was right. The last 15 years have been cooler. We've had 15 years of global cooling, as I predicted in 1990, based on the geologic record of the history of changes in the ocean water temperatures off the, off the Pacific. Here's where we are today. Look at this. Still cold. It has been cold now for 15 years, the ocean water, and guess what? We've had 15 years with no global warming and global cooling, and that's why. So all we have to do is to read the past history of these ups and downs, and this is what you get. Um, here is the ocean water temperature it, when it was warm off the coast of North America. We had global warming. When it was cool, we had global cooling. And this is a period of about 30, 25 to 30 years generally. 77 to 98, ocean water warm, global warming. And then in 1999, we shifted to cool, and we got cooling out to here. So it doesn't take much of an extension to say, okay, this is going to be a repeat of this, and we're in for about 25, 30 years of global cooling. Senator Anker has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, uh, in your previous slide, I have two pieces. It's your previous slide. Uh, it had 97 up there. If I remember correctly, 96, 97 was one of the most, more powerful El Nino, La Nina events that we've seen in decades. 1998 was 1998. 98, okay, yes, so 97, right. so that's it coming in then. So um, how does that get taken into account in your information? And then I've got to come back to the question I asked earlier because all the data that I've read and I have before me shows that particularly in the last 12 years, we've seen an increasing temperature. We've seen more records broken. Is that again because... I, I just showed you evidence to the contrary of that. I know, but but I'm telling you that I, I have peer-reviewed data in front of me that suggests otherwise. Is that because that peer-reviewed data has been manipulated? That would be my guess, yes. But it, it, I don't know what data you're talking about. If you'd, if you'd like to send it, I'd be happy to, to, to respond. Science Foundation, the IPCC, the UN, <laughs> the, you know, <laughs> the accredited answer is universities yes, they're the, they're like the... University of Washington, you know, Western Washington University, and others. Well, let's, um, I want, I'd like to finish up the presentation sure. and we can go into that stuff in a second. And I have one question also on, on the ocean upwelling issue here with regards to the temperature. Because getting back again to our shellfish issue, which is an important mm -hmm. one to uh, to myself right. and, and Senator Ranker and some other folks here in, in the shellfish growing regions, but but when, when we have the ocean upwelling that could lead to the global cooling aspects that you spoke about, and whether mm -hmm. or not we we agree or we take a look mm -hmm. at it, that we can look, would that be due to the the, the um, cooler water and the upwelling hitting the coast and coming into Hood Canal, which could result in a a lessening of the alkaline in, in, the, in those waters? I mean, that's an interesting one to, to take a look at going forward. That, that's certainly possible. The solubility of CO2 in seawater, which is what governs the, the generation of carbonic acid, which is what makes the seawater um, pH go up or down, uh, is a function of temperature. And so the colder the water, the more CO2 that can be held by the seawater, therefore the more the less alkaline it is. And uh, if you warm it up, then the sea will give off um, CO2 in the atmosphere, and it's actually the ocean that's controlling the composition of the atmosphere, not the other way around. Um, so the answer to your question is uh, that could explain some regional differences because we know that there is upwelling that happens about every two years off the coast of South America, the equator, and there certainly are upwellings elsewhere. So that, that could be responsible for a change in the um, pH of the seawater, yes, is the answer. So how are we doing on time here? How many, how many more slides I'm done. do we have? I'm done. You're done. Any more questions? I'm oh. done. I didn't know we were finished there. Any, any more questions from the committee? Senator Billig. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I want to go back early in the presentation. You, were, you, you, well, you talk about real evidence. Mm -hmm. And it seems there's um, one of the issues is the data. That, and I think if you said that you said that NASA is manipulating the temperature data, their temperature data, it's hard for me to believe that, and I was just wondering, what, what would be the motivation that they would have to manipulate temperature data? Why do you think that? 
I have no idea. I have no idea what people are thinking. What, what I can tell you um, with absolute certainty is that um, I have seen the original data that was collected at, at many places, and then I have seen that same data graphed by NASA, by NOAA, and by uh, the CD, CDDC, which is an arm of NASA, um, in 1980, and it was different. And I saw it again in, I don't know, 1990, 2000, and it was different yet. And I saw it again in 2000 and something or other, and it was different yet, and each case higher. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions for that. I have no idea about motivation or anything else. I'm, I'm not a mind reader. All I can tell you is what I observe, and that is well documented. Senator Anker. Thank you. Uh, along the same lines, and, uh, and, and thank you, Senator Billig, for following up on that line of questioning. I think it's really important. Um, you've mentioned a couple times in your presentation that none of this is being reported on because the media won't cover it. Could you enlighten us a little bit more on what's happening there? If, if, if you look at um, any uh, major network TV program, how many headlines have you seen that say, um, we have unprecedented global warming, and how many headlines have you seen that, gee, folks, the climate's cooling. Gee, it's the coldest winter in 100 years in Europe. Gee, folks, it's cooler. And the answer for my own personal experience is none. I can tell you personally that um, at, a few years ago, um, the New York Times did a, a feature presentation on, on some of my material. And I was called by every major um, national TV network, ABC, NBC, CBS, Hour, the whole the whole bunch, and then one by Fox one. Fox is behind you. You hmm? better say Fox. Uh, uh, Fox, <laughs> CNN, everybody, yeah. And so, um, guess what? Um, NBC called back and said, "Oh, we decided not to do that." Uh, CBS called back and said, "Oh, well, we're not going to do that." Um, MSNBC did uh, do an interview. CNN did, and Fox did. There were three, and CBS later did. Um, but ABC, NBC, all of those uh, withdrew their interest in um, interviewing. So from a personal experience, I've experienced, I have experienced that, that news blackout. And all you would have to do to recount the headlines of, gee, folks, uh, we have accelerating global warming, we're all going to die. And how often do you see reports of it's the coldest winter in 100 years? You don't see that at all. You just count them, and it's, it's a no no brainer. Dr. Riesberg, I had a question on one of your early slides. If we could go back, I think it was slide sure. number three or four, if we could get in there. And uh, I can kind of, let's go to. Um, what was CO2 graphed with, with the temperatures, and it showed the, um, the curve if you were to extend it with the CO2 from the 40s going onwards. Okay, so. I'm going to go back. You end show, uh, and, then, and then you can go to slide <laughs> sorter. <laughs> Stop me when I get there. Okay. If you go all the way down to end show, you can pull up slide sorter if this is a PowerPoint. Yeah, there Here we on, go. On the left. Okay. So go up uh, to the top. Go up to the top. Let me back up. Back up. Back up. All the way to the top. Okay, we're at the top. All right. Now come down yep. to that. Keep uh, right there. That slide. Um, second one from the top on your list, right this there. This one. Yeah. That one. So I don't understand about this one. If we're showing temperatures, this I think gets back to Senator Ranker's question a little bit about um, coldest time versus coolest. You know, in terms of the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. When I look at the chart, though, what I see the temperatures listed. For the um, coming into two, oh, it ends in 2000. That would be the difference. It ends in 2000, going backwards, mm -hmm. being warmer than it was in the 30s. So I, maybe I'm not reading the chart correctly. No, you're reading a chart correctly. This is data. If you, if you look at the at the source of the data here, uh, Hadcrut is the uh, climate data that comes from East Anglia in in England, um, which was the site of the ClimateGate oh. scandal, incidentally. Um, which is another issue altogether. Uh, and so their data uh, tends to be roughly the same as the NASA manipulated uh, data. Uh, and I didn't so ask that question, by the yeah. Can you go to the slide right above it? Maybe that's the one I was thinking about. Uh, this one. Yeah, and that, oh, so I see now and now when you see the spikes back in the 30s, but even there is the same. I don't understand this data because that still looks to me like it's cooler in the 30s on that data than today. Okay, well, what, I, what I can tell you is that uh, if you look at the source of the data, this okay. is this is Hadcrit data, which is the East Anglia data, which is the same as the NOAA and the, and the NASA data, and they have suppressed this, 
I can show you the, the before and after the suppression. And essentially what they do is they make what they call an adjustment. And you can imagine a glass of pure water and a glass of sludge. And what they do is to say, well, we've got these weather stations that give us pure water, but we've got these other ones that are sludge because the stations uh, give really inconsistent data. So what we're going to do is we're going to mix the two together. We're going to homogenize them. They call this homogenization of data. And then what you end up with is something that's, guess what? It's no longer pure. And so the, they, what they do then is they make the correction based on this mixture rather than just using the pure data. I'm looking at the pure data. They're looking at the sludge uh, okay. infected data. Gotcha. Okay. Do you have any other questions? Seeing none, I'd just like to thank you for the chance to come in today and testify in front of the committee, Dr. Reese Rick. I thought it was a very interesting uh, presentation. And I think that um, obviously there are, there are disagreements in, in, in Olympia and in the scientific world with regards to um, the material you presented today. But I think as legislators and members of the Senate Energy, Environment, and Telecommunications Committee, it's important that we take a look at all the data that's available to us to be able to make informed decisions as we go forward uh, because we have some, some major decisions that we're making here in, in the coming years with regards to long-term energy structure uh, issues in Washington State and how we handle a lot of different uh, decisions coming before us. So I think it's important that we take a good hard look at all of the uh, data that we can and, and continue moving forward in our role as legislators to try to make informed decisions. So I think that your uh, being here today was a, a, a good one for us to be able to, to take a look at the data that you present to us. And I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to be here with us today. Well, thank you for inviting me, and uh, I, would, I would urge you to don't believe what I say. Look at the data, and you can arrive at your own conclusions because data speaks way louder than opinions. We, we should go back to slide number one for your presentation, yes, I guess. Yes. You know, uh, <laughs> you all be trust all data. Other than data. Um, if we have uh, comments that need to be made, we can take them. Otherwise, we do have bills we have to get through also. Senator Honeyford. Yes, I just wanted to ask staff if they could uh, make a uh, color presentation of these slides available to us. Thank you. Great. Senator Ranker. Thank you. Just a, a, a closing request, and I, I thank you for taking time out of your schedule uh, for being here today. I would like uh, you to provide the committee uh, copies of any of your models or modeling that are peer-reviewed and where those were published, just so we can get a copy of that as well. I'd really appreciate it. I, I, yes, I, I can tell you that everything I showed you today has been peer-reviewed, everything. Okay. And I can give you uh, references if you'd like. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great. Thanks again for being here. And that concludes the, uh, the presentation. We will now go into some uh, back into committee hearings on topics that might not be as uh, interesting as this.